Hey, good afternoon. This is Steve Wilkes uh, with the Wagner Law Group in our San Francisco office. Welcome, everyone, to today's webinar. Hope the summer is going well for everybody. Today, we're going to talk about a few issues that um, I think resonate equally for advisors and plan sponsors. So what I thought we'd do is cover um, a couple of the hotter issues. I want to talk about rollovers. I know what we've talked about it. Uh, I think before in some different forms. I want to talk about it again today in a little bit of depth because it just comes up so frequently. We are getting constant streams of questions about rollovers and obviously the scrutiny in the in the industry has picked up quite a bit on on rollovers. I'm going to talk a little bit also about you know some lifetime income initiatives and also a little bit about health care reform. It's funny when I when I speak when I do webinars or speak live a lot of times people will say to me or you know when I'm my colleagues at the firm, Marsha Wagner and others, they'll say, so what's the hottest issue you could possibly talk about? And really, um, the audience, it might be a 401k audience or a pension plan audience or securities law audience for advisors, but really the hottest issue out there is really health care. So we're going to talk a little bit about that today as well, kind of how, how health care is kind of rolling over and impacting the um, the 401k industry. We usually try to stick to 30 minutes. I might run this a little bit longer today because I wanted to provide a little more detail if you don't mind. So here we go. Um, I think the thing about the rollover issue is you have to start by looking at the fact that uh, there is kind of a dividing line between uh, rollovers and and, for, and 401k plan services and that, that dividing line is really ERISA, you know, what, what, what that enables you or does not allow you to do under the law. So we'll try to talk a little bit about you know some of the legal issues and how to understand them and some of the game plans and strategies that we've developed with our clients for for compliance in a practical way. So one of the uh, you know I think one of the best things about 401k plans is that a participant's account is portable. When you retire or you know terminate employment, um, you can roll your plan account to uh, an IRA. And IRAs are interesting in that they tend to have more um, an, a broader universe of, of funds available for investment. So they're, they're kind of a different creature. So you know financial advisors and other professionals, um, you know, they can provide guidance to a plan sponsor, but they can also provide a lot of help to participants as they make their investment decisions for um, th their assets once they once they leave their employer. However, uh, ERISA, our good friend ERISA, imposes a lot of restrictions on advisors who are providing plan services to a plan sponsor and also want to offer rollover related investment assistance to participants. Um, you know, ERISA prevents advisors really from simultaneously offering plan services and rollover IRA services, you know, in any old way they want to offer them. And because the penalties under ERISA are so severe, you know, one solution might be for advisors to simply stop offering rollover services if they're already involved at the plan level. Obviously, that doesn't make much sense. I mean, just from a business point of view, it's not what advisors want to do for, as a business plan or business strategy. And um, it also denies participants from getting the benefit of some good help. So, you know, we think that there's a good way for advisors to to do both and kind of work in and around ERISA and serve the best interests of the plan. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about, you know, how you can uh, develop your service model to basically, you know, be at the plan level and still cross-sell in a manner that we believe uh, is consistent with ERISA. So I think we need to talk first just a little bit to set the frame. I know many of you uh, in this listening audience, either on the advisor side or the plan sponsor side, have a feel for this. But let me just explain talk a little bit about the nature of ERISA's limitations and restrictions. We have to understand what those restrictions are um, so that advisors are able to modify or you know work with their service model to become compliant with ERISA. So by definition, when you're cross-selling, you're involved at the plan level and now you're cross-selling to another aspect of your service platform, which is helping the IRA rollovers. I mean, obviously, that creates a, a naturally a conflict of interest. So you can see why, you know, from the regulatory point of view, um, you know, there, there can be, you know, you can see where potential abuse might arise when a firm, you know, uh, abuses that position of trust or abuses that ability. 
and um, hence we have you know concerns under the law and you know from the regulators. So capturing rollover assets would be a classic example of cross-selling, and you know a lot of times an advisor is already very deeply embedded. They have a long-standing relationship with the plan sponsor. They've met a lot of the plan participants over the years at educational meetings. So it would be very easy and tempting. It would really make sense, you know, for the advisor to kind of work with the plan participants or encourage them to roll their account balances to an IRA as soon as they're eligible. And a lot of times in the way our financial system is structured, you know, an advisor can earn a lot more. The fee structure, you know, can be higher um, on, on rollover IRA services than, than the fee structure that's in place at the plan level. And that, you know, that is a little bit of the, the rub right there. So the DOL has certainly recognized this and um, it's made specific references to this problem of IRA capture and cross-selling. We all know that it's an issue they're aware of. It's come up in, uh, they've mentioned it in their regulations about the new definition of um, fiduciary and, and the participant disclosure regs and other, there have been other places where they've said, by the way, you know, we're, we're interested in hearing some of your comments about cross-selling and IRA capture. So we know it's high in their agenda, as it is at the SEC overall and FINRA right now for, for slightly different reasons. So because the DOL is concerned with this issue, they've released some, some guidance on how the prohibited transaction rules, the fiduciary rules, would apply. And I think the main takeaway from that would be that the, uh, you know, you have to look at the general prohibition against fiduciary self-dealing. Um, even though ERISA imposes, you know, numerous requirements to work with plans generally, the prohibition against self-dealing is really relevant in the case of, you know, an advisor that wants to do plan level and roll over IRA services on behalf of the same client. So, you know, you have ERISA and, you know, the mirror excise tax um, rules under the code prevent self-dealing. And um, what they really mean is that an advisor can't provide fiduciary, quote, inve you can't provide investment advice quote, investment advice. That means something special to all of us, right? You can't provide investment advice that would increase the compensation payable to itself or its affiliates. Uh, so in other words, you can't make an investment recommendation that ends up with a higher payday for yourself or your, or your colleagues, even if it's the best intention, best advice in the world, even if it's, even if it's totally on good faith. It, you know, these prohibited transaction rules are per se, they don't allow for shades of, of gray. And also, Let's not forget that you have a plan sponsor sitting by while this is going on, a co-fiduciary, and co-fiduciaries can be liable, or I should say also a fiduciary under the plan. Therefore, as a co-fiduciary of the investment advisor, the plan sponsor could be liable and subject to some exposure um, for certain aspects of the transaction if it doesn't handle them properly. So going back almost 10 years now, back to 2005, um, the DOL came out with um, you know, people talk about it as the rollover opinion. It's advisory opinion 2005-23A. And that was really, that really stirred up a lot of conversation back then, and it still is to this day. Um, and when you just read it kind of, you know, on its face, what it, re what it really says is that any rollover advice from an advisor that's providing any fiduciary advice to the plan could be a prohibited transaction. And, you know, the, the DOL doesn't really totally get into its reasoning and kind of state some conclusions in that opinion without really explaining them too deeply. But I think what they're saying is that, you know, the DOL seems to be saying that you can't discuss the advisability of rollover distributions um, and think about that in contradistinction to the availability, of the ability to have a rollover versus the advisability of taking one. So they also said, you know, on the other hand, an advisor who's not a planned fiduciary can freely advise participants to roll their accounts to an IRA. So an advisor who's not providing any fiduciary investment advice to the plan sponsor, um, you know, wouldn't have to worry about these. And similarly, you know, you know one could argue that a, a consulting firm, a broker-dealer firm that was not providing, quote, investment advice as defined under ERISA, you know, would also be in the same place. So this, this created a lot of issues and a lot of problems. Um, you know, on the one hand, it says that, you know, an advisor that holds, it, holds itself out as a provider of fiduciary advice uh, is barred. You can't do the rollover business. It also seems to be um, problematic or is problematic for other advisors because, as we know, um, arguably, you know, a registered rep 
um, could inadvertently cross that line beyond, you know, providing incidental advice or providing, you know, a call to action or a generalized, avail you know, recommendation of some sort. You know, uh, Register Rep can inadvertently uh, be providing investment advice as well. So it's a big issue. So the whole thing about whether or not you're, you're a fiduciary, we all know, comes down to being a functional test. So if you act like a fiduciary, then you're going to be one, even if you haven't, even if you don't have paperwork that says you are appointed as such. And you know, rendering investment advice for under ERISA in exchange for any form of compensation, uh, you know, individualized and what have you, is is clearly viewed as fiduciary activity. So you have to think again about you know exactly what it is you're providing. You know, we, we can get a little deeper into the definition of investment advice here. So the way the law, and this is all changed. We all know that sooner or later this is going to, excuse me, it's going to change and be refined a little bit. But right now, you know, where you're providing advice on a, quote, regular basis, where it serves as the, quote, primary basis, where it's individualized, um, that clearly is, uh, I think, generally agreed as fiduciary advice. Um, some, uh, you know, broker-dealers, you know, you know, can argue that, um, you know, maybe they. You know, maybe there's some legitimate. Uh, well, I should. There are some legitimate legal distinctions that can be made. But the thing is, it's really hard out there in the real world. You know, the more contact, the more time you spend with the plan and its participants, it's really hard to say that you're really not serving the plan. It becomes harder to say you're not serving the plan as a fiduciary. Um, so I think this means that you know, regardless of your role or title. When you're out there in the rollover business, you really need to be thinking about these these guidelines and, and whether or not you might get caught in a trap. So now that we've um, we've established, so we, we've talked a little bit about the ERISA restrictions. So you know, how do you go forward? You know, the DOL cited one court case in that in that rollover opinion back in 2005. It's called the Verity Corp case. It was a Supreme Court case, and the takeaway on that case was that. You know, a person can operate in a fiduciary and non-fiduciary capacity at different times with respect to the same plan. In other words, the hat can come on and off. So, you know, the view of our firm, and we think in accordance with the Supreme Court's analysis, is that the, these prohibitions against rollovers do not apply or should not apply when advisors, whether you're a deliberate or an accidental fiduciary, are offering your rollover, their rollover services in a non-fiduciary capacity. Um, so we've come up with some strategies and some recommendations um, um, that ensure that when you are clearly acting in a non-fiduciary capacity when providing rollover assistance, um, you should be in good shape. Now I want to point out that a couple of things. You know, even though the uh, the Department of Labor has not specifically endorsed you know any particular you know set of rules or procedures or protocols about this, we we feel confident at our law firm that these guidelines are consistent with the Supreme Court analysis and we've given some um, some legal opinions and a lot of support to people uh, on, a, on a very comfortable basis as to how this issue stands under under current law. So the thing, let me just, the Verity case, basically what they're saying is that um, that you can, there are three factors you really want to look at. Um, to determine, you know, kind of what hat you're wearing. So that if you, the Supreme Court can, in Verity concluded that an employer, in a certain scenario, was acting as a fiduciary, and it looked at it in the con, in the factual context of the communication it made, the fact that it was made by those people at the company who already had plan-related authority, and the communications themselves were plan-related nature. So this three-factor test, we think, um, we 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 use when we think about whether an advisor is offering its services to plan participants in a fiduciary or a non-fiduciary capacity. Um, and I'll quickly roll through through some of these. Um, the I think the first, the factual context, the first factor, um, you want to make sure that the communication is made sort of a non-plan related setting. So we advise, we recommend that our advisors really don't discuss rollovers and all, you know, or, or from promoting their services, you know, at any plan meetings that are held by the plan sponsor. You know, maybe it's okay to, you know, it is okay at one-on-one -on -one meetings with the participant, um, you know, different in different settings, but kind of you, you need to be able to distinguish it from a plan-related 
uh, environment. The second factor, plan related authority, you know, the advisor wants to ensure that its delivery of services is not in any way really part of its plan related authority. So we have worked um, and developed, you know, some uh, a written letter or a confirmation letter, if you will, that a plan sponsor would sign, clarifying that the advisor's rollover services are unrelated to the advisor's plan or services. In other words, the plan sponsor is hired, the plan fiduciary has hired the advisor to do X, and this IRA stuff is not related to X. It's totally separate from that context. And the third factor, you know, plan-related nature. You know, the advisor should really make sure that every individual understands that the advisor's offer to provide these rollover services and be helpful has nothing to do with the plan itself. It's not plan related. So we've also developed, um, you know, like an acknowledgement form, if you will, that uh, participants can sign. I should also further say that, you know, everything about the other things I'm going to say about you know, these documents, the plan sponsor letters, acknowledgements, um, everything is very factually intensive. So we've kind of designed and work with a lot of different delivery structures for services and, and, and products from different broker-dealer firms or RAA firms or dual registered firms. So th there'll be a lot of little um, distinguishing characteristics of the programs we develop. So I'm speaking in a generalized sense on, on this stuff. What do you do, by the way, if a plan sponsor or a participant says, I'm not going to sign that? So you know, we think of an advisor is holding itself out as a fiduciary. Uh, clearly, um, then it should only offer its role. It should only offer its services to the plan, to you know, to the plan participants if the plan sponsor executes that letter. Um, you know, if you don't get that acknowledgement from the the plan sponsor, I think it would be hard based on our analysis and and, and protocols for an advisor to demonstrate that it was acting in a non fiduciary capacity. So now you're out there, you're you're selling services, you're rolling out there. So what are some of the what are what are some of the things you can do? Some of the procedural guidelines, if you will. Well, I think the first thing, you know, and these, again, these are all. It's not an all or nothing list. I mean, I think that these factors all matter. If you did nine out of ten of them, you you still, you know, we think you'd be in good shape. But you, if I compared you with someone who implemented ten out of ten of them, they would have ten legs to stand on rather than nine. So you have a little bit of now, you know, kind of an overall game plan, a little bit of a bird's eye view, what we think. Um, the first guideline, we talk about, you know, we're thinking about the discussion of rollovers at plan meetings. We, we think you should discuss the availability of rollover distribution features under the plan. And just as an educational matter, hey, your plan, you know, has rollover features, you know, when you're speaking with plan participants. But you shouldn't really make recommendations on the, on the advisability of whether or not you should take a distribution from the plan or roll such funds to IRAs when, when you're speaking at a plan meeting. Um, you should never encourage participants to roll their accounts or advise them on how to invest rollover distributions at those meetings. We think when you're at these meetings, you should limit your promotion of rollover IRA services to simply informing the participants that, you know, you also have other services, you know, personal services that are unrelated to the plan. And you'd be happy to discuss rollovers and other personal investment strategies, you know, their own financial plans, you know, what have you, with them individually. And that, uh, don't think that you should really state that you're offering ro rollover IRA services as part of the services you're providing um, at a, you know, to the plan at a plan meeting or at one-on-one -on -one meetings with participants. When you do, how do you offer rollover IRA services? Well, you do that when you're holding one-on-one -on -one meetings with your individual participants. Um, that's pretty much the way to do it, but not at plan meetings. And when you meet with your plan sponsors, you want to ask them to sign a letter, or you know, a lot of times we build this language right into the advisory agreement. That's another place where it might be um, the language might be housed, you know, you know, representations and just you know conditions right in the advisory agreement itself. When you meet with participants, you know, ask them to sign and, and explain that the services are, again, are not being offered by you in your fiduciary role with regard to the plan, but totally separate. And um, you know, again, you want to get some confirmation letters from the plan sponsor, but if you don't, if you don't have them, then we think you'd really want to, you really want to walk away from doing the rollover business at this plan. So, what does that all mean at the end of the day? So we know that advisors that provide plan services have these ERISA hurdles or restrictions to navigate, and that you can navigate around them and work with rollover assets if you follow 
these certain procedural guidelines, and they would ensure that you know the factual context of your communication is in a non-plan related setting. You want to ensure through either the language in the advisory agreement or confirmation letter that the advisor's rollover services are not part of you know its plan related function or its plan related authority, and that the individual participant understands you know that the advisors offer you know again is not is not plan rate plan related. So we think if you follow these guidelines and and um, if you're clearly operating on a registered rep platform and not trying to intentionally be a fiduciary advisor, there are some best practices that come in here as well. And by the way, uh, I think built into built into this now we're also adding um, we built in the FINRA disclosure language that came out earlier this year on the IRA business. Uh, clearly, registered reps need to have it. But we we think it's going we think in in effect in effect it's become an industry best practice. And we work it into, um, I think, in certain situations, we work it into uh, the advisory side of the platform as well, just as a as a best practice. There we go. There's, my, there's our little famous statement. The reason I w the reason this is in here is that um, every client that we've worked with on the rollover business, you know, uh, be it smaller, you know, independent firms, you know, or larger regional or even national firms, you know, everyone's platform and delivery, the way they do it, the bundling of services, the way they get paid, everyone's story is just a little bit different. So it's important that you take what I just told you as, as being, I think, very valid generalized statements, but we'd have, we might have some, we would likely have some refinements and some uh, clarifications if we were to work with you directly one-on-one. -on -one. And if anyone needs help, we'd be glad to do so. So just shoot me an email and let me know where you stand on this issue. Let me talk a little bit about, uh, just quickly here, a little bit about lifetime income um, and kind of what's happening uh, in the defined contribution world. You know, there's some legal considerations, some fiduciary issues under ERISA, some DOL proposals, and I'll make reference to the, uh, quickly to the IRS regs as well. So what's happening is, you know, the, the government, you know, the President Obama's administration has looked at um, how people draw down their money to be just as important as asking them to save it in the first place. So, so the issue of you know kind of retirees outliving their assets has become real, and there are proposals out there. You know, the, this administration, I think, and and with some encouragement from the retirement industry as well, has really worked hard to motivate uh, or to think about ways to annuitize um, plan accounts. So, you know. Uh, but rather than mandating it, you know, there might be some legislation on that someday, these policymakers have kind of looked for incentives to encourage sponsors to offer lifetime income. I think if you're a planned sponsor listening today, one of the takeaways here is to think about, you know, the traditional forms of distribution from your 401k plan and think about working to add new forms of options that speak more to the issue of creating lifetime income rather than, you know, a lump sum distribution or just retired mandatory distributions every year. So one of the things that's come up is, you know, the government, they've, they've looked at the idea of lo these longevity annuities where you can roll um, 401k balances to a pension plan. And they're also looking at some disclosure rules, you know, to encourage participants to think about um, how to, you know, spend their money a little differently. You basically have a couple of different solutions for this. I mean, you've got, you know, defined benefit plans, you know, have to offer annuity benefits. Most defined contributions don't. but there are three different ways to do it. Um, a participant could be directed to, you know, just to invest in a product that's a lifetime product outside of the plan. Uh, the plan sponsor could offer some sort of distribution option inside the plan, or it could use a lifetime income solution as an investment vehicle within the plan. So under the first approach, you know, sponsors simply direct their participants who are interested in lifetime income, lifetime income, sorry, to uh, IRA annuities. And uh, so instead of rolling over to an IRA, you roll over to an IRA annuity. That seems, you know, that seems pretty simple. Um, if a sponsor wanted to make lifetime income options available to participants, it could amend the plan to add annuity payments as a distribution option. And that would be, that could be pretty powerful. Or there could be an in-plan solution where the 401k plan sponsor just selects, uh, you know, a group annuity. We work with a lot of group annuities through uh, a lot of our 
clients at the plan sponsor and advisor, registered rep level, you know, use uh, GACs uh, from the major, some of the major companies uh, as a kind of a funding vehicle. And there's lots of lots of advantages to those. Lots of good things about them. And those annuities will typically have a broad menu of investment options, you know, for participants. For example, you could have mutual funds as an underlying investment in the group annuity. So when the participant retires and is ready to commence benefit payments, the value of that account is simply annuitized or converted into an annuity. I'm going to, uh, you, you could talk about these retirement income strategies in general, how they stack up against each other. A little chart there with some comments on it, I think, in light of where I see where we are time-wise. I'm just going to move forward just a little bit um, in terms of where we stand. So, you know, if we have, we do have some options in the, in the, in the marketplace right now on lifetime income solutions. Longevity annuities, group annuities, they could or they may or may not have a guaranteed life withdrawal, you know, GLWB rider on them. Um, DOL has made it clear that this is a fiduciary action. But the problem is that there's really not a lot of clear guidance from the DOL that, that tells sponsors, you know, how to select and monitor. So we're getting there. They've put out some things. There is some existing guidance, if you will. Um, but it could be, you know, it could, it could be a little better. Um, nonetheless, even though even in, even in this in this world of a little bit of, of uncertainty, a lot of a lot of plan sponsors still are beginning to offer lifetime income solutions. I think the, 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 some of the most recent big press was uh, United Technologies. That was pretty huge, and there is a safe harbor for providing fiduciary protection, uh, and that safe harbor has five components to it. The the, the plan sponsor must observe you know general um, prudent standard. Best consider the annuity provider's ability to make future payments, uh, the cost of the annuity in relation to the benefits and, ser and services provided, and then the plan sponsor has to evaluate that and maybe seek some outside help, uh, you know, if possible. It's always good to get a good financial consultant, insurance expert, attorney, you know, someone that can help you, uh, your advisor, someone to, uh, to help you with it. I'm going to uh, move over these steps a little bit quickly here and point out also that, um, you know, when you, when you talk about the fiduciary standards for lifetime income, I, I also just wanted to mention that, you know, there are qualifi qualification requirements for a QDIA that would apply to group annuities and, you know, those need to be kept in mind. There's some special rules that are applicable to that. So, you know, what's been happening to facilitate this move, um, as you know, the IRS has done it. They've come out with some couple of revenue rulings that encourage the annuitization of plan benefits and it's encouraging employers to use their DB plans as a way to offer uh, a lifetime income option lifetime income option for the uh, if their employees also have a 401k account balance so if an employer had a DB and a defined contribution plan they could you could roll your DC balance to the DB plan and convert it and uh, you know that's the beginning of a trend I think also, we just had a couple of weeks ago. We got our final regulations on. Um, we got our final regulations on longevity annuities, and let me just say about those that um, you know, a longevity annuity is meant to provide. Well, what is it? It's meant it's something that's meant to provide an income stream that'll commence at some future advanced age, like 80 or 85, as compared to uh, retirement age, and. And, you know, it, it, it provides a way to work around the required minimum distribution rules. So the uh, proposed regulations are basically, you know, creating some exceptions here. And they're saying that these a qualified longevity annuity uh, must provide that distributions commence um, not later than a, than a date that, that is no later than the first day of the month following the month in which the participant attains age 85. The premiums paid from the participant's account to purchase are of the lesser of 25% of the account balance or $125,000. Uh, and, and that'll be adjusted for cost of living uh, going forward, I think in $10,000 increments. At the time of issuance, a participant must be informed that the contract is intended to be a qualified longevity annuity contract. And that would be, you know, you put language in the contract, a rider, or endorsement, something like that. Uh, it can't be a variable contract, by the way, or indexed or anything like that. And there's no cash surrender feature on these contracts. 
and there are certain death benefits it has to provide in accordance with the regulations and the contract has to provide that after distribution start uh, you know there's some other um, generalized requirements that relate to distributions for annuities that apply like limitation on increasing payments and things so as a practical matter you know a plan sponsor that wants to offer one of these things you know really ought to take a look at it and, and again make sure that it does so and that it thinks about its uh, fiduciary responsibilities as well it's also a lot of talk about whether or not these you know we should have like a default uh, provision for you know a default investment and that's an argument that's that's just going on right now and still continuing um, the government the the G the government accountability office has noted that um, for some participants default annuities might not be appropriate given their health or other conditions so this is a debate that I think is still kind of in progress and is going to work for for a little while and the geo the, the government accounting office has also recommended that the DOL that the department really update its guidance on um, <laughs> investment education which is still pretty strong even though it was first issued in 96 but um, the guidance needs to be updated to give employers and uh, you know providers if you will the comfort they need in order to provide participants uh, the right kind of assistance with decumulation you know all the all the advice before all the, everything has always been focused on acquiring assets now it's how to how to spend it how to draw it down and you know there's also some legislation out there um, as I mentioned earlier lifetime income disclosure act is one that would require plan sponsors to inform participants annually of uh, how their account balances would translate into guaranteed monthly payments that could be pretty pretty powerful probably probably pretty scary for a lot of people too so let me move on to uh, I skipped a few slides here just because of where we are on the clock let me finish by talking a little bit of how what's happening how healthcare is sort of hitting their retirement world as I mentioned earlier I think it's the number if anyone is out there is wearing the hat of working in your company's employee benefits department or you're at a firm that advises on benefits, clearly uh, health care is the largest, uh, most impactful thing we've had on the on the radar for the last number of years and will be. It's, I mean, the, the scope of what's happening with health care is absolutely huge. The split court decisions yesterday, there's so much going on in this world. So, you know, at first, you, you wouldn't think that the um, patient, that the, the uh, the Affordable Care Act would have much of an effect on retirement plans because you know right that it regulates health care not qualified plans right but when you look at it a little closer you know it could have an impact so for example you know how could how could that work you know first of all employees um, you know the Affordable Care Act guarantees that everyone has the right to purchase health care generally you know through their employer or through state exchange or a federal exchange this means that employees won't necessarily be tied to their current job just to maintain health care. Um, you know, wow, people are really can be mobile now. You know, how many times have you heard, well, I kept that job because of the health care? You know, higher paid employees might have the ability to leave and establish their own business or retire early. That could trigger earlier retirement plan distributions or different timing on, on the drawdown cycle from plans or the distribution cycle that we're seeing now. And you'd have to rethink kind of you know long-term investment policy strategies and liquidity strategies in terms of uh, the money leaving plans sooner than uh, had traditionally occurred. And also, all these terminating everyone who leaves you know generally uh, needs to be replaced. So the old workers were likely to have been fully vested. The new hires might have a little bit of uh, a vesting curve to conquer before they're vested. So this could save. This could be a cost savings to employers. You know, since not all the new people will have to work the same number of years to become vested, um, so this results in reduced plan contributions. Uh, you know, new employees you know, a lot of times have less experience, which means they have smaller sal salaries. This results in reduced plan contributions and smaller matches. So everything kind of trickles over. You know, if you stop and think about it, it can, you know, kind of the positioning of healthcare and what that means kind of changes the way people play the game in terms of their employment and their 401k plans, theoretically, anyway. So, you know, and lower paid employees um, um, who are required to have health care coverage might find they can't afford to pay for health care and a 401k contribution. So, you know, starting, so starting this year, I guess, you know, there's a penalty for failing to obtain certain health care insurance, 
which might influence some of these people how to choose, you know, whether to choose contributing to health or retirement. And this could change some interesting participation patterns and investment patterns. The uh, effect on employers, you know, beginning next year, I guess it's 2015, um, em employers have to provide a certain level of benefits or pay penalties. Some employers that, that you know, employers that have already established this amount, um, the amount they want to contribute are reacting to this new requirement by maybe cutting back on their matches. This reduces the incentive for employees to make contributions. So, you know, this seems like a, this seemingly um, neutral transfer of assets from one form of benefits to another could ultimately result in problems with discrimination testing on the retirement plan side. And for administrative purposes, you know, a lot of employers prefer to have newly hired to become eligible for all employee benefits at the same time. But for the employer who provides the opportunity uh, to enroll at the time of hire, that's fine. Employers who want to delay for a longer period of time um, are, you know, now subject to the 90-day rule under the Affordable Care Act, which very generally means that group health plans, uh, well, it requires group health plans to make health insurance coverage available to uh, an otherwise eligible employee no later than 90 days. So there's another little ripple effect that comes over. The Affordable Care Act could affect the retirement plan community if, if you know, if brokers find that the commission that their commissions are diminishing uh, due to the marketplaces, you know, due to these exchanges, and they decide to change their business and go into some other line of business. So you might see a lot a, a new array of personnel, a, new, a lot of new players who profess to be experts uh, that are in the business of brokering and offering um, health plans. You know, I think the the success of these marketplaces could also lead to a very different approach to retirement planning. Uh, Senator Harkin, you know, the, uh, you know, from Iowa, you know, had proposed the USA Retirement Funds, which would be similar to the healthcare marketplace, and in that individuals can contribute to the fund with or without the employer to establish their own deal. And you know, at this point, it remains to be seen you know, how all this type of Thing will work out, but when all is said and done, you know the healthcare thing is definitely rolling over and trickling over. That ends my discussion. We're at uh, 37 minutes. We're in just a few minutes longer today. I hope that's okay. Our next webinar we're going to have in, in so many people are gone in August. We're going to have on September 10th, and that's going to be focused more for the advisor and broker dealer community. I'm going to do an update on um, some Advisors Act issues and some Finder issues. We'll talk about the new proxy rules and some things like that. So that will be our next topic. If anyone, uh, thank you very much for attending. If anyone has any questions, please email them to me. I'd be glad to respond, and we really appreciate your time today. On behalf of the Wagner Law Group, thank you very much.